Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about what I'm going to speak about today. So anyway, my name is John, John Hibbs, and uh, I'm obviously going to be talking about toxins in the home and what they are a bit and where they are and how to avoid them. Um, uh, anyway, this, is, this talk is for you, so I want you to feel free to ask questions. I think one of the advantages of it being a relatively small group this morning is that we've, we'll, we'll probably have time to digress a little bit. If I'm true to form, I've probably got more material here to share with you than will happen in the allotted that I can comfortably do in the allotted time. So, but that said, I do want you to ask questions, particularly if you're not following what I'm saying. Uh, the, the lecture, the way I've set the lecture up, I've set it up so that there is a handout. It's really all about the handout, because I want you to leave here today with uh, uh, handy information, information at hand that you can use and that you can share with your your family, your neighbors, whoever you think might be able to use it, and refer to back later. Um, and so I chose, for better or for worse, I think it's going to work, to set it up in a table form. The tables can get a little complicated. We're going to definitely take time to walk through them one at a time. But so if you get lost, in particular, if you're not sure what table I'm on, what page I'm on, or if, what, if, I'm, if I'm not saying enough to locate you correctly on the page or table, please raise hand and let me know right away. Because you'll follow and you know, understand what I'm saying a whole lot better if you're tracking with me page to page and section to section. So um, anyway, um, let me just start off with a few points. But because uh, I want to put this in perspective. And you, oh, pretty much everything I'm going to describe, well, except we're going to go off on, I'm sure we'll go off on abundant tangents because I just can't stop myself. But, <laughs> but uh, pretty much everything, the, takeaway, the takeaways today are in here. So including my, my intro, it, I want to share several from one through five points here to get us started. And the first is that uh, the toxic effects of the chemicals in the home occur at, uh, significantly at very low levels, often at sub-odor uh, sub or sub-smell levels. Um, and so the small levels of exposure in our homes do matter. That is a point. It's, certain, it's not a cause for panic, and I think that's statement number five or four. We'll get to it. Number two... Um, the, um, it is our children who are very definitely most at risk. And obviously this, the talk today is for our children's parents and neighbors and aunts and uncles and grandparents, and that would be you. So one of the things, in addition to reducing your own toxic exposure, and the younger you are, the more probably relevant and the more to gain from that uh, prevention and, and avoidance you have. But obviously our children are, are the youngest humans um, in our world. And they will benefit the most from avoidance of toxins in the home or toxins anywhere. And so, so do bear that in mind, because uh, the longer a person is exposed, for the longer, the more time a toxin has to interfere with development or, or mechanics in a body, organics in a body, the more toxic effect it can have. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that. So um, number three, the toxicity that's most relevant to us is this chronic exposure over time. And because it happens very slowly, this is the don't panic. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about many poisons today. Toxins equals poisons, etc. And these are scary concepts, or certainly can be. But I very definitely don't want you to leave here today frightened. I don't want you to leave here today frightened at all. I want you to leave here today encouraged that, that you can empower with information encouraged by how simple it is, actually, and inexpensive it is to avoid um, most of the toxic exposure in our homes, and, and, that it, and encouraged that it really will make a difference in your health, and in particular your children or your neighbor's children's health, over time. Um, which, which moves us well, and in, in in actually the end of the, the third statement here on the first page is that our bodies have a fantastic ability to rid, to process and excrete toxins safely. Absolutely fantastic. It's, it's really quite remarkable because many of the poisons that we're exposed to are the poisons that human beings have, have created, synthetic chemicals that we've put into our, into our environment through agricultural processes, through industrial processes, through the building materials in our home, and so on. And, and so they're, they're compounds that, in a way, have never, at least in their, in, in their holism, been seen by uh, but, uh, bios, the, the, the body biosystem before. And yet, our bodies are absolutely amazing adaptable. And, and, these, and virtually all of these toxins will come out in sweat, urine, 
feces, and so on. And so our bodies, it's absolutely remarkable how well we can get rid of them. And there's plenty of data that validates that. In fact, I, I, I meant to mention earlier, I actually teach the toxicology class to the third year naturopathic medical students. And it's, it covers in great detail uh, these, these process, processes and methods by which our bodies get rid of toxins. So there really is tons of data that shows that uh, we're remarkably capable of protecting ourselves. So I want you to trust that. I want you to trust in your body and realize, so if all you do, and you'll leave here, I think, empowered today to do a better job of it, if all you do is reduce your exposure to poisons, and in other words, get out of the way, this marvelous instrument, our body, really will um, pick up the rest and can protect itself. Uh -huh. So the question is, is it primary the liver? And, and um, thanks, Anita. I, um, primarily the liver. The liver, probably more than any other organ, single organ, would, is responsible for biotransforming or enzymatically breaking down and transporting those toxins towards the exits. And it and, and actually is one of the exits. Um, but that said, uh, the kidneys are nearly equally important. And the, Quite a few of the volatile or vaporous toxins exit through the lungs. And they all exit through the skin really, really well. So one of the things I'll mention later on, I think I'll mention it later on. I'm not sure if I will or not, because what this lecture is not about today is actually how to detoxify your body. Although that's a wonderful, fun topic, and I know you have tons of interest, and maybe for another day. But, but know that um, uh, all of these toxins that I'll talk about today, every single one of them exits the body in sweat. So if, if you, whether you do a lot of yard work, and sweat, or, or aerobic exercise and sweat, or do hot yoga and sweat, or go to a sauna and sweat. Every time you do, you're ridding your body of the stuff we're talking about today. Have confidence in that, and do it more. It's a wonderful healing thing to do for all kinds of reasons. So number four is stop the exposure and get the process started. Uh, number, so number five is I just want to give you an example of the kind of stuff I'm going to cover today and how potent it is. And this is actually one of the more, I'm just kind of cutting to the chase. Let's, we're giving away one of my best points here, number five, preempting preemptively the, because number five talks about what's in, um, what's in house dust, and the rest of the lecture is going to be about going from toxin group and individual toxin to toxin toxin group, and you'll 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 hear over and over and over that many of these are located in the dust in the home, that they are in the dust in our home. Well, look at the list; it's lead, toxic metal. Some, some volatile organic compounds, benzene, toluene, xylene, styrene. Styrene is what styrofoam is made out of and, and our car tires are made out of. Phthalates, which are plastics. PVC, which is the hard part of plastic material. And I'm, I'm going to go over all this in more detail. Uh, the, the VOCs are volatile organic compounds and their related solvents. The, these perfluorinated hydrocarbons, the PFCs, which are the waterproofing materials in our environment, the Teflon, the no-stick coating inside non-stick uh, cookware, the Scotch Guard that we sprayed on our clothing to make the raincoat, or the, or the 6040 parka, more water, less water permeable, and so on. Um, dioxins, I'll talk about them. Flame retardants, the PBDEs, and sister brother, sister chemicals that are in many, many comp uh, of our um, materials in our homes. They um, all wind up in house dust. They wind up elsewhere, too. Some of them are in water, some of them are in the air. But one of the principal sources of exposure is actually they'll accumulate in house dust, either by being tracked in uh, on our shoes from, the, from our car, from the driveway, from the street, or the yard, um, and, uh, or by being shed from the walls and, um, and woodwork and furniture and foam and foam materials and so on inside the home. They wind up in house dust, which is... So the, the beauty of that is, in simply knowing that, this is going to be an inspiration to do what you all know. Well, not all of you, most of you. I should speak about myself. What I know I should do more often, which is vacuum. So, believe it or not, something as simple as vacuuming every week, maybe, yeah, probably every week, vac vacuuming well and getting a really good quality vacuum with a HEPA filter uh, and maybe ideally a dust meter so that you can ensure that your carpets and your floors are actually clean, goes a long way to reducing significant exposure to all these things. Seriously, the, the quantity of lead of every one of these compounds in house dust is measurable. Um, I'll elaborate. I'll go on. But how simple is that? No, it's there. So, oh, and the other piece of avoiding, of keeping the, the, the dust in our homes less toxic uh, in the first place, or, or just less prevalent, is take shoes off at the door. So it's take shoes off at the door when you come in from outside and 
um, vacuum more often. How simple and inexpensive is that? Real gain in reducing toxic exposure in the home. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. How about not having carpets that accumulate all that stuff? So how about not having carpets that would accumulate all this stuff? I, um, uh, I, I guess I would just say for people who have a good vacuum and enjoy vacuuming and will vacuum regularly, the carpet's still fine. I say it's, it's, it's more important to just have the kind of floor surfacing that you're likely to clean because you don't see it as a, a deterrent to your, yeah, to yourself, yeah, your habit. Okay. Well, flip the, flip the page. Well, by the way, so, the, yeah, the way the, um, flip the page to page two. And the first table, then, is a table of toxic metals. And I'll go through them one at a time. And all of the tables, there's, I think, five tables in the talk this morning. And the first one's toxic metals, and they're all set up the same way. In, in there's, there's horizontal rows and then vertical columns. On the left side of the toxic metal column, the first vertical column is the name of the metal. And then moving from left to right, the next vertical column is chronic toxicity. And you can see the name at the top. And the next vertical column over is where they are in the home. And then the, f the fourth column over on the right is how to avoid each of the toxins. Excuse me. And so, um, and by the way, everybody with me so far? We're on page two? Great. This is how the tables are laid out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention which column and which, which row we're in a lot and just to try to help you not get lost. But if you do get lost, definitely let me know and I'll help locate you. The last page, the very back page, page six, on the flip side of your third piece of paper, is a summary of all the items in the fourth column, the how to avoid column. So it's really the practical takeaway. What do you do when you get home? And you know, if you wanted to actually share one piece of this, again, with your with your brother or sister because they've got more kids than you do or they've got kids too or they, they're the ones the kids are your neighbor or, or your, 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 your grand, the parents of your grandchildren or whatever. That would be the page to share, obviously. It's the simple how-to. And most of it's really quite simple. So back to page two, toxic metals. Um, the first metal, of course, is lead. And um, I'm sure that in regards to lead and many of the toxins I'll speak about today, some of you, especially who are more internet savvy or interested, just have a history of being interested in the topic, some of you will know a lot about what I'm going to say already, and, and some of you probably won't. So I um, apologize in advance if this is redundant for you, and, um, and I'm hoping that there's some takeaways for everyone. But So um, uh, lead, chronic toxicity of lead. And I'm, in, and I'm going to, for the most, almost entirely today, be talking about chronic toxicity, not acute poisoning. The, the issue... For, for most of us uh, uh, is, again, is the, are the health effects of long, slow, i.e. chronic exposure over long periods of time and retention over long periods of time of levels of toxins in our body that, that uh, public health agencies, toxicology specialists, and so on would definitely not say equal acute poisoning. So we're not talking about acute poisoning. We're talking about slow, insidious toxic effects over long periods of time of, of um, levels uh, of chemicals in our body that are at or only slightly above average population exposure. See what I'm, that's what I mean. That's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going to be speaking about today. So, so back to lead. Lead at very, at virtually at every level studied, including well below average levels in blood and tissue and of, of, of human beings in North America, uh, is a um, do, uh, has negative effects on learning, on cognitive processes, on development of the nervous system in, in infants and children, starting in utero and all the way through childhood. Um, it has very significant also effects on the whole cardiovascular system, principally by starting, uh, starting out as uh, a, an originator of an inflammatory process in the lining of the blood vessels all over the body. And we're talking about a very low-level, microscopic, if you will, inflammatory process. And that's true of most of the toxins I'm going to talk about, or many of them I'm going to talk about today. But lead, because of that, has been shown to very clearly um, um, speed up the incidence of the, of the hardening of the arteries, the formation of the arteriosclerotic plaques in arteries that then uh, lead to, that have consequences such as heart attack and stroke and, and decreased peripheral circulation and, and so on. Um, the, um, there also, lead is also accumulates in the kidneys because kidneys are an exit. Kidneys are one of the, kidneys and liver and skin are the principal exit out of the body for lead. And so those are, the, the kidney and liver are places where lead will accumulate and the kidney is particularly vulnerable to damage by lead 
it, the, the delicate tubular system in the kidney will be injured. So it's very well understood to be a source of chronic kidney disease and, ultimate, and, and ultimately, even when present in slightly increased amounts above the average, uh, a very definite contributor to an increased likelihood of developing kidney disease and kidney failure someday, as well as high blood pressure and so on. So I'm at the point where I actually, I do a historical screening uh, process uh, or series of questions with all the patients that I see because I do see, uh, supervise the toxicology clinic on Wednesdays here at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health too. But all the patients I see, so I'm to the point where I've, I'm, I'm clear that every, every patient with hypertension, early, early kidney, um, very early reduced kidney function, certainly a history of um, um, heart attack, or any other marker for arteriosclerosis should be screened for blood lead levels. It's, it's a very prevalent issue. Moving on to where lead is in the home. As you know, it's in, it's in, um, uh, in older homes or homes, well, older homes that have not had the plumbing updated. It's in the, it's in the pipes, therefore it gets in the water. And this is for real. You remember a couple of years ago, the, the huge concern in Seattle about just this, it came to light that because our school buildings, the public school buildings were built before the 1970s when lead was still permitted to be used uh, in high quantity in the fixtures and in the piping and in the joining materials and plumbing, that, that much of the water in, in uh, school drinking fountains and so on that children were drinking contained way too much lead. Did you all remember this? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's all been fixed. I know that it will be. I know people really do care, and there were great efforts to jump right on that. Uh huh. Does it <coughs> diminish with time, like the lead pipes, once they're used? Does, it's in, really interesting question. So does the lead appearance in the water diminish as the a pipe ages because maybe it's mostly been leached into the water prior and there's less? Uh, I don't know, but I don't think so. I think that the, 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 the rate at which it leaches into the water is quite slow, and therefore it can do so for decades without slowing down. That's my impression. And because the toxicity of lead is, is so severe at such small exposure levels that even this tiny bit that gets in the water any at all is not good, essentially, if you're following, tracking what I'm saying. So, you, so even, the, the, even at the slow leaching into the water level, which can go on for many, 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 many years, it's still a very clin a significant clinical issue. Am I speaking loud enough? Okay. Uh -huh. What are the most, um, with, without you know, uh, getting off on too much of a tangent, what are the most reliable methods of detecting toxic metals? Urine, hair, blood. I'm gonna I'm gonna save that question for afterwards, Anne. Okay. Yeah, if you would, um, and I'll 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 reserve the right. I'm, I'll be here as long after the lecture as you like. Anne asks, what are the best tests for these things? For for lead, most of the time it's blood. I said I wouldn't answer, but I did. I can't help myself. Okay. But but in general, um, I'll I will be here afterwards to answer questions for as long as anybody wants to stay. And and since everybody doesn't have all morning, I'll. I'll try to set some limits. So, uh, anyhow, um, so you you all knew it was in the water. Uh, the um, it's in the dust and dirt in the home, dirt, dirt dust inside the home. It's in the dirt outside the home. Particularly, uh, it's in the dust in all of our homes. It's there's more in the dust in the home if the home was built, i.e., painted prior to mm, the early 1970s, uh, as late as. Into the late, the last state, and I don't remember when Washington banned lead in paint and, and in piping, but I, I, but all the states in the United, all 50 states did somewhere in the 1970s. So you can know that if your your home was built or painted prior to the early to mid 1970s, <coughs> it it almost certainly has lead in the paint and in the pipes and paint inside, outside, etc. Uh, in pr in particular, it was in the oil-based paints which at that time were favored certainly for outside use and quite often for inside use as well because they were so much more durable. But anyway, so it slowly, slowly, slowly particulates over time and winds up in the soil outside the home and in the dust inside the home. So one second. So it, we're, we're looking at, I was talking about house dust a second ago. So obviously it's in the dust inside the house because it came directly off the woodwork and so on inside the home. And, and then it was tracked into the home from the soil outside uh, by the dog, the children, the adults who aren't taking their shoes off at the door, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. And you're going to hear me talk about that like 14 more times today, so please forgive me. It's such a wonderful, simple, important point. There's also a great deal of lead in the soil uh, near the street. 
because also prior to the 1970s there was lead in, in the gasoline in very high amounts in the United States, <coughs> as there still is in much, much of the world. And um, uh, it's well understood that the reason that, that adults, and particularly children, because children are out playing in the yard and playing on the sidewalk, and they're closer to the ground, and they're breathing in more dust, if the finely particulated lead in the dust will actually get all the way down deep into the alveoli in the lungs and be absorbed in the bloodstream, inside or outside the home, and out by the street, and we're talking about the children. Uh, and the children are also playing in the dirt and putting stuff in their mouth and going and having a snack, and they didn't wash their hands. And so over the years, it adds up. And this is why the, the average child in North America right now, well, the happy news is that all the children and adults in North America have a lot less lead in our bodies. Boy, I am just going to take like till 2 o'clock if I give you this much detail. Uh, have uh, a lot less lead than children did and adults did uh, even 10 years ago because the removing of lead from paint and removing of lead from gasoline is working. The average lead burden and exposure is, is slowly dropping. It's not quite where we need it to be yet, but it is dropping. Uh, uh, great news. And the, and the, for all of that, though, children's blood average le blood levels of lead in North America are, are a good 50, 60 percent higher than the average adult. And it's because they're closer to the ground and there's all this hand to mouth going on and breathing of dust inside and outside the home. So these are, these are real, real issues. And, and people, children and adults who live in cities of a population greater than a million, because there's more lead in the dust, because there's more cars and buses, and there was more lead deposited prior to the early 1970s from all the fuel with containing lead burning and falling in the soil, um, higher average levels still. So, all right. It's to the point where the Centers for Disease Control is actually recommending that every child in America be screened for lead. But I'm totally digressing. All right. So um, how to remove? You got the idea already. Remove shoe. With, well, a couple other places. Glazes on some dishware and, and pottery, in particular from Mexico and China. I'm definitely at the point where I, I will buy gorgeous uh, dishware from perhaps from China to, to maybe look at, but I won't eat out of it. Uh, it's a real problem. And, and then Chinese, too many Chinese, it's not the majority, it's a minority, but too many patent Chinese patent herbal medicines contain toxic metals, most notably lead too, so I personally won't take them either or prescribe them. Uh -huh. What about um, handmade pottery that's made in the U.S.? Is there lead in this? Yeah, that's a great question, and I don't have a great answer. The question is, what about handmade pottery with glaze, the glazes in the United States? And I, I, I does anybody know? I don't know, I don't, I've not heard that there's any regulation or monitoring of toxic metals and glazes, but I, I can definitely assure you from what I read that the, that the awareness of that's increased a whole bunch, and people are, are, are certainly trying to do better and be aware of that. Uh, I think it's much, much less likely, but I don't actually know the answer. And it is certain that that lead um, on the pottery will Right, it will slowly leach out. Mm -hmm. <coughs> very, very slowly. And it may make a difference if the food's acidic or hot, etc. Uh -huh. I have a whole collection of lead crystal yeah. at home and not expensive stuff, right. just you know, sort of right. average price stuff, and I'm scared to use it now. Yeah, you probably should. Anne's asking about lead crystal, fancy lead crystal, crystal gl dark that was glassware for drinking. It, it scares me too. I think we should probably be not using that, as gorgeous as it is. Get rid of it. Okay. Or just look at it. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, great, let me talk about mercury. Oh, remodeling. What it's, it's right, right, actually right on the Centers for Disease Control NIA, at NIH, uh, one of the most important things that the average person in North America can do to reduce their lead exposure also is be much more careful around remodeling the home. Uh, one of the principal sources of exposure to lead is living in home while it's being remodeled. And this would be a home built prior to the early 1970s. B why? Because the paint, because the lead in the paint's being disturbed. And it winds up finely particulated in the dust, ground powder underfoot. So uh, ideally, uh, move during a remodel. But if you can't, because obviously most of us can't do that, then very definitely partition the remodel really, really well. Don't live in the part of the house while it's being remodeled. Plastic with like a couple of parts couple of, partition with a couple of plastic barriers and vacuum a lot and maybe get a dust filter. And know that that dust does contain lead. This, and this will go a long way, seriously, to reducing exposure. Just knowing that and taking those very simple measures. 
Mercury then um, uh, similarly is a neurotoxin um, uh, associated with neuropathies, tremors, and specifically Parkinson's disease, but all kinds of mood, mood swings, mood disorders, depression, um, um, sleep problems. And uh, <clears throat> average mercury exposure also used to be much higher than it is now because we didn't used to know that mercury was as toxic as we do now, or either that or, either that or we were much more foolish than we are now. Uh, the uh, a very important immunotoxin too, it's associated with uh, both hyper or autoimmunity and immune deficiency and more frequent infections. It has some hormonal disruptions, most clearly in the thyroid system. Um, uh, the most common source of mercury exposure, uh, very well worth being conscientious about and, and is from eating fish. And this is one of the harder, more confusing topics today to talk about because fish, fish are absolutely beautiful. You're, you're, you, you're, you'll, you'll have been taught long ago that fish are marvelously healthy to eat and it's absolutely true except for the mercury. There's wonderful omega-3 oils that they're so good for the immune system and the developing brain and so on. It's, that's all true. They're marvelously nutritious and it's a horrifically sad thing that we've polluted the oceans with mercury because all fish contain mercury. And it's, it's a myth that if you get a fish from the North Atlantic or the North Pacific or whatever that it, it, it contains negligible mercury. That's just, it's a myth because the mercury, while it may not be 100% equally distributed over the planet, it's for all practical purposes nearly so because it's distributed in the rain. It goes, we put it into the atmosphere principally by, by burning coal and other materials to create energy and as you know it comes down in the acid rain and, and that's a process that occurs nearly uniformly everywhere. So it's in fresh water, fresh water, salt water, all the oceans, etc., etc. and it's extremely sad. The, it accumulates in fish because by um, uh, uh, it, it gets in small fish initially that eat marine material, that eat plant material, and then it, it moves up the fish food chain, if you will, by big fish eating littler fish, so the, and then bigger fish eating that fish, etc. So it winds up being that the largest fish are the ones by far, or the largest fish that have eaten that are the most aggressive eaters, I suppose is the way to put it. And I, I'm not a marine biologist, and that's about as far as I can take that thought. <laughs> because uh, I don't actually understand it all that better than that. But the larger, more fish-eating fish are the ones with more mercury, which is why a king salmon has more mercury than a sockeye, which has more mercury than a coho, which has more mercury than a, a pink. And the older fish, the fish that... The, the older the fish that live longer, thank you very much. So they may not get real big, but if they live a long time, they're going to have a... Thank you for that. Perfect. And, uh, and as you know, the tunas, so you sushi lovers... Uh, I, I, I won't beat it to death. There are good Washington, there are at the Washington State Department of Health uh, website and at the uh, Centers for Disease Control in Washington, NIH, CDC websites, there are, and any, all the states, it, there are plenty of really good fish eating advisories. Um, I actually don't think they go far enough. I'll, I'll just say just a little bit about that, but in general, they recommend keeping your, I was just checking this week, they recommend keeping your, your low mercury fish and they'll tell you which ones those are, to consumption to twice a week max, and, and, uh, and then avoiding, was, actually I don't remember the details off the top of my head. It depended on the class of fish, and uh, yeah, and your negligible, wait, and your negligible, you load a moderately mercury laden fish to twice a week max, and your, and your relatively, your very low mercury laden fish to maximum four times a week, and that includes the lowest are the little teeny ones like sardines and herring and so on. Um, and um, I, uh, well, I agree that it, I, I think it's very fine because there's almost negligible mercury in a, in a little tiny fish. I do agree that you can have sardines and herring at pretty much, certainly numerous times a week. I'm finding that even people, because I, I'm screening all my patients for how often they eat fish on a regular basis, and anybody that eats it two or more times a week, I'm, I'm screening with a, a blood mercury level because for this organic recent mercury type or fish type mercury exposure a whole blood test is the desirable desirable test and most of them even at twice a week are coming back uh, either high normal high normal and when it, it, which is too high well above the disease producing thresholds that are well established in the literature not all but most and and uh, certainly when people get to three or four times a week 
many of them are even frankly elevated outside outside the actual normal range. And the normal ranges for these metals, I don't want to elaborate too much, but they're not nearly stringent enough. And, and so by the time a person actually gets outside the quote unquote normal range as established by the Centers for Disease Control, their mercury levels are um, 10 times what's shown to be toxic. They're way too high. Uh huh. I, I'm very concerned. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. I, I, um, um, the children in my life are taking uh, mercury free, it's, it's tested, DHA rich uh, omega-3 fish oil supplements because, and that's kind of a cop out, you know, and eating fish occasionally. And, and, and we and never, are never served the high, well if I have anything to say about it as you can imagine. And sometimes in a relationship there's a little give and take there, but in any case, <laughs> Uh, uh, never the high mercury fish. So even the even the Centers for Disease Control website recommends never eating the highest mercury fish, the sushi grade tunas, and so on. I mean, in an ideal, in an ideal situation or, or life lifestyle. That said, as it says right here, if you will eat fiber with your fish, and that includes sea vegetable fibers, which are called alginates. Take a, take some chlorella tablets. Um, eat some seaweed. Um, or much more commonly, eat an apple or some whole grain um, or beans. Beans are chock-a-block, chock-a-block with fiber. It, it, it binds with the mercury the diet that, that was in the meal, the fish meal, in the intestines and takes it on out with the stool, keeping it from ever being absorbed in the first place. And it, will, it won't do it completely, but it'll do it mostly. It's a, it, so don't eat fish too often. And when you do, because you'll still, you want to enjoy those wonderful be uh, benefits, Eat a whole bunch of fiber. Take some psyllium. Take some psyllium powder. Whatever works for you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And know that you're, you'll be protecting yourself mostly. And, and your body will get rid of most of the rest. And that's even those couple of small measures are, I think, put you in a comfort zone. Way ahead of the curve. Super. Then um, mercury spills um, from uh, light bulbs. I just want to real quick um, uh, mention that probably that now fluorescent light bulbs, the, the mercury vapor fluorescent bulbs are really have really caught on and that's a good thing they're saving tons of energy they do contain mercury and I think that uh, we as a population on a large scale haven't really come to terms with that health risk yet they haven't been around long enough but what what's what's coming out is that people don't really understand that when the when a fluorescent bulb breaks that that actually represents a very significant toxic hazard by the way if a, a thermometer breaks if anybody anybody here actually have a mercury thermometer in there they're pretty much obsolete now good that's just as well. Because the amount of mercury in a thermometer was, we now know, and who knew this? I mean, I was raised with glass mercury thermometers and they broke on a regular basis. Working, I worked in a hospital, they broke all the time. Sometimes they broke in people's mouths and people swallowed it, believe it or not. And, and um, we now know that the quantity of mercury in a thermometer breaks in the home, that's enough to actually call, to vacate and call hazmat. I am not kidding. Really? Yeah. Because mercury wants to be a vapor at room temperature and as a vapor, it's inspired into the lungs and is virtually 100% absorbable. And unfortunately, the mercury vapor has a very high affinity for brain tissue. It goes right to the brain in seconds to minutes to hours and stays there a long time. So, and, and it is mercury vapor that's in a fluorescent light bulb. Not much, but it is there. So what you're supposed to do is, is like hold your, get everybody the heck out of the house, hold your breath, <laughs> open all the windows and doors, and maybe put a fan in one of them and leave. Does that make sense? And because it will, it's a vapor, thankfully. The good news is it's a vapor. And so it'll, it'll leave pretty quick. The small amounts that get stuck in the carpet fibers or whatever will, will, within a few hours, for the most part, vaporize and they'll blow out too. So it actually is simple enough to just open the heck everything up and evacuate and ventilate like crazy, in other words, and stay out of there for a few hours. Then come back and it actually is safe to vacuum up the, um, the broken glass because the mercury is gone. If you actually had a macroscopic quantity of mercury, i.e. a broken thermometer, uh, the, the last thing you want to do is actually try to vacuum it up. That just turns it into a vapor faster and everybody's breathing it. Mm. You want to leave and call hazmat. Does that make sense? Mercury is a lot more toxic than we used to realize. But so anyway, that's fluorescent light bulbs. I'm going to avoid uh, dental fillings because that's a real can of worms. But I, I put my advice in writing right there and you can read it. Um, aluminum. 
a huge public health issue. It too is a neurotoxin. The debate's pretty much over, at least in the medical literature, about whether it's relevant to, to uh, the development of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common classic senile dementia, or dementia of aging. Uh, uh, and um, the answer is yes, it is. Uh, it's not the only cause, but it's an important contributing factor. And the um, principal exposures, as you can imagine, are from, are from um, actually number one, aluminum beverage containers. I would say, number one. And number two, aluminum cookware and other storage containers and aluminum cooking stuff, lining a pan with aluminum foil, especially under high heat in the broiler, say. Who, who's still putting aluminum? Well, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Let me just say that until a few years ago, I was putting aluminum foil in the, in the pan, putting the fish on it, and uh, broiling it. And under that high heat, aluminum vaporizes. I don't know if you've ever, you ever look at, like, disintegrates. it disintegrates. We used to go camping and catch the fish and put them in the fire on aluminum and, 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 and pull it out and like half the aluminum's gone. And a lot of it went up in the air, but some of it went into the fish. I'm sure I didn't do any testing, but oh my gosh. And I, so I don't do that anymore. I actually don't fish much anymore. I like, developed a conscience as I got older, I guess. So, uh, but if you do, more power to you. That's wonderful. The um, aluminum. So aluminum foil, can't, pots and pans. So as you can imagine, my advice is, is uh, stop using uh, aluminum cookware, pots, pans, baking dishes, and so on. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, especially at heat, and especially when cooking acidic materials, the classic being, say, a wonderful red sauce, which is full of citric acid that's in the tomato in particular, and citric acid, is probably the number one favorite in, the, in, in, the, in nature's plan, favorite compound for aluminum to bind to. The number one, citric acid. Most aluminum in our bodies is bound to citric acid. If it doesn't come in bound to citric acid, it finds some, a citrate molecule, and binds to it. It loves to be bound to it. It likes to be bound to uh, acids. Include this, it's a family, it likes to be bound to a family of acids called carboxylic acids, which includes some amino acids and citric acid and blah, blah, blah. And uh, question. Can't hear you very well. I've seen Pisco's golden sandwiches wrapped in aluminum. Yeah. I think a sandwich wrapped in aluminum is a very, it's probably a negligible risk. Okay. Me, because I'm like a double Virgo, I, I just can't help my, I'm kind of compulsive. I wouldn't do it, but I, it probably doesn't matter. Okay. Again, no. yeah. Fruit pies, it, it's, it, yeah, it's acidic and then it's baked in there, yeah. Yep, I wouldn't do it, okay. personally, wouldn't do it. And then the number one source of exposure, in my opinion, and this isn't data, this is just my appraisal of the situation, for most people is, is aluminum beverage containers, which unfortunately, if anything, are getting even more, more prevalent. And the last time I flew on an airplane, the, the water that was offered to me was in an aluminum can, so I refused it. Carbonic acid, by the way, that, that carbonates and makes beverages, be, for fizzy beverages fizz, is also a carboxylic acid, so it, it binds aluminum like crazy. So beer, whatever, you get the idea, pop. It's all got measurable aluminum in it. This is such an important issue. It was actually mentioned in, a, in, a, in an article in the journal Toxicology, the preeminent toxicology journal in the United States in 2007. And, uh, they suggested that, that, that I, since we can't be, um, we can't, we don't seem to be on a track to getting rid of aluminum beverage containers, that we consider putting something in the beverages to bind the aluminum that gets into the beverage to keep it from being absorbed. Does that make sense? And this is, I am so digressing here, but one of the, it was very exciting. One of the things they suggested, one of the possibilities or options they suggested was a compound called silicic acid, which is a carboxylic acid, that will, will indeed bind aluminum in the GI tract and keep it from being absorbed. And, and if, uh, the, if, it in, it'll, if it doesn't bind, apparently if it doesn't bind aluminum in the GI tract and then go on out with a stool, it'll be absorbed, sans aluminum. And then if it encounters any aluminum in the bloodstream, it'll bind it in the bloodstream and, take it, it, and ensure its excretion in the urine, which is just really exciting. And guess where this compound is? Silicic acid. It's chock-a-block in the plant horsetail. And they mentioned horsetail right in the, in the article in Journal Toxicology. It was so exciting. They said, we should, be, we should consider putting an extra, something like horsetail extract in soda pop. Kind of blew my mind. 
was, but botanical medicine is getting taken more and more seriously. I, but I actually saw a patient in clinic last week for follow-up on aluminum testing who is a, um, well, actually I'll keep the specifics out for his own privacy sake, but in any case, he had a history 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, working in a profession in which large quantities of beverages were, were consumed on a regular basis all day long because of the amount of sweat that the, that the work produced. And, and they, they always drank canned pop and juice. And he would go through at least a six pack out of aluminum beverages. And his aluminum level, he, hasn't, he doesn't have any current significant aluminum exposure. We, we checked, we interviewed him very carefully because his aluminum level came back frankly elevated and I rarely see that. I mean, actually, frank, it was from exposure 20 years ago, which is remarkable from, from cans, I'm certain. The good news is we started him on horsetail capsules three times a day, and he'll be, it'll work, it'll work. So, um, cadmium, mostly, uh, most exposure from cigarettes, it, uh, aluminum, lead, mercury, all these metals, unfortunately, cadmium stay in the body for a very, very long time, uh, time periods measured in decades. I don't mean all of the mercury or, or cadmium or lead that comes in. Remember, our bodies have a tremendous ability that you can be excited about and comforted by to excrete this stuff. And 99.8 or 9% of the metal that I'm exposed to today, within a few days my body will have excreted, or a few, well not a few days, but a few weeks will have excreted. But it's that, it's, so it, that's why it's the chronic exposure that matters. One exposure doesn't matter. It's the chronic teeny tiny accumulation from retaining a teeny tiny fraction of what I'm exposed to day in and day out for months or years that matters because it adds up. Does that make sense? All right. So. Not to freak out, but cadmium, um, uh, the principal exposure in North America probably is from cigarettes. And, and know that even if you were a smoker and, and, and congratulations quit, you know, however many years ago, the, the half-life of cadmium in kidney tissue in particular, kidneys is the principal reservoir in the body, kidney and liver, and the kidneys are very much injured by it, um, is measured in decades, so it's still there. And so come see me or see your doctor and have them do a urine cadmium test, a urine cadmium level. Uh, they probably won't know how to interpret it though, so come see me. <laughs> it turns out that even slight elevations above the population mean uh, of, of urine cadmium levels correlate with a dramatically, a significantly increased risk of eventually developing hypertension, heart attack, stroke, kidney disease, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Is there anything that cadmium binds to, like aluminum? Yeah. Cadmium, cadmium excretion is enhanced by some of the synthetic chelators that are used. It's also been shown to be enhanced by the, the antioxidant, N-acetylcysteine. But I, I suggest you come talk to me first because you want to make sure you're not being exposed to cadmium currently. Or, or if you're pretty sure you're not, then that's a safe thing to do. If you're being exposed to it currently, it's kind of complicated, but it's actually not a safe thing to do, to mobilize it if, if you're being currently exposed. You want to stop the exposure first. So. It is in some paints. It's in some artist colors. Is it still? I'm not. I haven't painted in a long time. But it used to be there was a cadmium white, a cadmium yellow, and many many of these. I'm 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 just. You're right. I'm touching the surface on a lot of these topics, including where are these metals and where are these poisons, because um, heck, it's 11:25 and we're supposed to be done, but. Uh, <laughs> And we're just getting started, so I hope you're interested. Um, the, um, um, but yeah, there's plenty of cadmium in especially shipbuilding paint. So patients, people who even today have a job currently working in shipbuilding, but especially in the past when it was even more so, it would be a risk factor for cadmium exposure and, and cadmium screening as well as um, lead and so on. Arsenic is mostly a, um, uh, an issue in areas that are, uh, um, I can't remember the word, but anyway, locally, ex locally polluted. So that would be, that would be um, the, some of the regions around Tacoma, Washington, for example, from the old arsenic. Arsenic's a natural metal in the Earth's crust. It gets, it's in plants, and that's natural. Uh, the problem is that when large quantities of ore or, or wood are burned or heated high, uh, to a high temperature and producing smoke, there's, there's a, in, in, in it varies regionally, but, but there can be a lot of arsenic in that smoke, and that's, that was true from all the industrial activity around Tacoma. So now there's a great deal of arsenic in the soil and regionally in, uh, around that area. 
So that's just an, so people that live in that area need to be more mindful. Arsenic then would very much in that area become an issue in house dust. But the same precautions would apply. Uh, wash hands before eating, take shoes off at the door, and um, uh, vacuum more often. And that'll address most arsenic, arsenic exposure. Not so much an issue in Seattle. Uh, the other uh, uh, source of arsenic exposure worth mentioning is from the old arsenate, copper arsenate treated wood, outdoor wood, and which is, as of several years ago, banned. Uh, and I think it's finally all the supplies have been used up and you can't, can't find it or buy it anymore. And a lot of communities have undertaken the project of replacing, getting rid of the playground equipment that the children were playing on that were made out of arsenic protected wood. Uh, it worked super as a preservative. The trouble was it accumulated on the surface of the wood. It oozed out and accumulated in very high levels on the surface of the wood. And studies were done that showed that if, if you put, a, put your hand on there and pulled your hand away, there was, I don't remember how many times the allowable exposure limit came off in one handprint, but it was, it was, it was alarming. Enough so that legislation was passed quickly uh, and uh, it's no longer available. And, but so my advice, if you do still have a deck that was, preserved, that was built with that, that material and there's children around, um, think about put, saving, up a, saving up your dough and, and replacing that deck when you can. And certainly in the meantime, have your children, don't, don't, don't not have them play out there, I guess, but, um, but um, have your children wash their hands before they eat and stuff if they've been out there and so on. Does that make sense? It comes out forever. I know, but the deck, how long would it be? Oh, you can, I, it was banned. Does anybody know for sure it was banned three, four, three, four years ago in, in, in the Home Depot and everybody was allowed to sell their remaining stocks and I think they ran out a year or two ago. And, so it's pretty recent. Yeah. Uh, iron, not, not, I must move along a little quicker here, but iron uh, in, is obviously a, a healthy nutrient in, in uh, necessary amounts it, it, and uh, in order to avoid anemia and chronic fatigues and so on. It's critically healthy nutrient in normal amounts. The trouble is when it's present in ex extra, extra iron around the body is not a good thing is what I'm trying to say. And because, um, yeah, extra iron is not a good thing. We're a high meat eating culture. Um, we, um, acu we're iron accumulation above and beyond need is very, quite common in, in North America. It turns out that when iron is present in excess, it's, it's highly oxidative. And we all, we all know oxidation is bad, antioxidation is good, just to keep it simple. Oxi oxidative means uh, all is synonymous or correlated with in exciting inflammation processes. So excess iron is pro-inflammatory and it's being correlated with cr uh, heart disease, heart attack, etc., arterial disease, diabetes, um, cancer, the big three, because it's pro-inflammatory. It's, it's not an acute thing. It's a very slow thing over long, long periods of time. This, this is, but this is just one of these marvelous points where I just, if you'll just leave informed about this, you can do some very simple things about it, in, in the, which will take care of the risk. And, and one of the simple ones, actually, is start donating blood. Uh, have your, have, your, have your, your physician, your personal physician, check and make sure you're not anemic, because if you are, you need iron. But if you're not anemic, um, uh, have them actually do an iron panel and see. If you've got anything more than a little bit of extra iron in your body, and they can more or less tell you, I like to see patients' blood levels per the standard blood test sort of in the low normal range, if you will. Does that make sense? So not a lot of extra. If they're above that, I suggest start donating blood. The blood bank will love, it's good, it's a win-win. You're giving it to people, though, the blood. That's okay. That's okay. We're not worried. If, this is not an acute exposure issue. Oh. They need the blood desperately. A little bit extra iron in one pint of blood isn't going to hurt them at all. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, no problem. It's not like it's full of mercury or something. Uh, okay. Or, I mean, even if it was, that's still not much mercury compared to how much they need the blood. That's right. Okay. So, okay. yeah. You must be like a quadruple Virgo. <laughs> Oh, Scorpio, okay. Uh, you get the idea. So I, I actually recommend that if you're not anemic, you do not take a vitamin with that contains iron, and this includes uh, postmenopausal women. There's a myth in the United States that was probably started more, or certainly helped along by the Geritol company, if you're old enough to have seen the old Geritol. It is not true that, it, that aging is that improved by taking extra iron. 
Uh, in fact, older people, because they, they bleed less for multiple reasons, they're injured less in sports, they're not menstruating, etc., accumulate iron more than younger people for the most part. And they're the last, and they're already prone to inflammatory processes. And um, uh, so they're the last group that needs extra iron floating around. Um, so I, I actually am not a fan of, of cast iron cookware, as gorgeous and wonderful and aesthetic as it is as a cooking tool, uh, if a person's not anemic. If you're anemic, great. If you're not, I wouldn't use it. And, or if you do, just donate blood and don't worry about it. Does that make sense? Does that mean enameled too? No. Good. Enameled would be fine. Enameled cast iron. Well. Yeah. Is the iron and cast iron different to the iron? It's elemental iron, so it's not going to be absorbed well in, if it's not altered to, a, to a, the right ionic state. But, a, but for better or for worse, it's one of the things that the, the acid in the stomach does is make that change, which is in general is a good thing. I mean, what I'm saying is the acid in the stomach helps iron be absorbed. So it, it becomes an issue. Does that make sense? It, the iron, it, the iron that uh, starts out from a cast iron pan that's in my diet, ultimately is not as likely as be, to be absorbed as the iron citrate, which is already in acidified form that I took in my iron supplement. Does that make sense? But it still becomes a source that adds up over time. So we're a million miles behind schedule. Flip to page three. This is the uh, volatile organic compound table, and uh, volatile organic compounds are um, volatile means wants to be. A, wants to evaporate at room temperature. Everybody got that? Volatile means wants to be a vapor or evaporate at room temperature. And uh, um, organic means it's made out of carbon, mostly carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. The, um, you've all heard probably, or most of you probably heard of, then looking at the name column, the vertical column on the left, benzene, just want to mention that most of these columns, uh, items, benzene, toluene, xylene, hexane, styrene, and then those, in the next box down, the other solvents box, the chlorinated hydrocarbons, the, these chemicals that are in cleaners, the butyl solve and, excuse me, diethanolamine and DEATEA and APE and so on, MTBE, the, down below that. These, these are actually all made from fossil fuel. They're made from petroleum. So they have, they're cousins of each other, if you will, some, some distant cousins, but they're, they're related. And so, therefore, they share many of the same toxicities and problems and so on, which is why... I decided not to put my do, do all the box dividing in the in the chronic toxicity column and where are they in the home column because they're they they're well they're not all identical in their toxicity or where they are in the home they're awfully similar there's an off so instead of repeating myself a million times box to box and group to group I just got rid of the boxes and so um, anyway as as a group they're all well benzene benzene toluene xylene these are in gasoline um, they're in fuel. There are significant amounts. It's, we, we, we like to think that, that, the, that, the, that the bus or the truck or my car that I'm driving in burns the fuel completely and, and so on. And it's a nice clean process and, and that it burns it completely. But the truth is that some small percentage of fuels unburn. And the benzene that was in, in toluene and xylene that were in the, in the gas in my gas tank of my car before I drove down the road, uh, s some small amount of it winds up in the air behind the car after my car is driven by because it's, it's, it's nearly completely burned, but not completely burned. Does that make sense? And then that floats around. A person on the sidewalk, maybe that's me on my bicycle riding behind the car. I breathe it. Or, uh, it, it, or more likely, it gets into the dust. This is why it's in the dust in our homes. It gets into the dirt near the road or in the driveway. I track it in on my shoes, and I don't take my shoes off. And over the weeks and months, because I hate vacuuming, the levels of xylene and benzene build up in the dust in my house. Does that make sense? And you, it's, uh, on a short-term basis, an issue? No. Exposure over years? Yes, does matter. They're, um, especially to children and pets. They're small, they're close to the floor, they don't wash their hands as often as the adults. Um, nervous system toxins, they're all, they're all essentially, all, almost all, virtually all of them are nervous system toxins, affect cognitive processes, memory, there's, there's, they've been clearly associated with learning disorder, some developmental, um, developmental problems too with the developing nervous system in utero and uh, in, in infants and children. Um, uh, cardiac arrhythmia, some neuropathies, numbness, and tingling. So I'm in the second column here under chronic toxicity. The, uh, the benzene, toluene, xylene group in the, in, the, in the first box on the left 
uh, actually been specifically correlated with some bone marrow toxicity. So now I'm back in the chronic toxicity problem, the second, the second cluster down, the anemia, it says anemia, leukemia. Is everybody with me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, um, very definitely been correlated with some of the anemias and some of the leukemias. It's one of the, when I have a patient with chronic leukemia in my practice, the, one of the first things I do is check their, check their body load of benzene, toluene, et cetera, and talk to them about an effective cleansing regimen. And it usually helps. Platelet deficiencies as well, because they originate from bone marrow. Has anybody here ever experienced low platelets? You don't have to tell me. Never mind. I shouldn't ask. That's your personal health information. But it's pretty common. It's actually pretty common. And the first thing I think of are these benzene, toluene, xylene groups. Uh, immunotoxins, um, because they affect blood cells, but also they're... they're very clearly excitants of the whole inflammatory process. They cause that same microinflammation in the lining of the blood vessels that lead causes. They're associated with uh, all the connective tissue autoimmune diseases, lupus, Raynaud's syndrome. I'm sure Raynaud's is common. Some of you have experienced Raynaud's. The cold weather, exposed to cold, sudden cold changes in the tips of the fingers turn white and painful. It's a vascular spasm that's caused by low level inflammation in the blood vessel. And I, I'm guessing as a clinician, of course, I'm, I'm a little biased. I focus on toxicology that, that environmental toxin accumulation is the number one cause of, of Raynaud's or, or maybe right along with food allergy, which can also cause a similar inflammation. Um, so know that cleansing regimen are good for, for all of these. Uh, you know, well, exposure reduction like we're talking about today and then effective cleansing is very useful for these, these problems. Um, they're all injurious to the organs of excretion where they concentrate on the way out, and that would be liver and kidney and lung. Because they're volatile, they, many of them to a certain extent will actually be breathed right back out, be expired right back out. Some 40% of the most volatile, like benzene, actually exits through the lungs, so the lung can be injured too, or the lung can be injured on the way in because they're volatile, they're often gaseous or in a vapor when I breathe them in, so they'll hurt my lung first pass on the way in. Um, so asthmatics, very relevant to asthmatics, and then many of, several of them are hormone disruptors uh, too, and I'll elaborate that more when I get to some other toxins on down the way. So I'm in the, th- in the third vertical column there where they are in the home, and I've touched on a bunch of that. They're in the dust. Um, the next thing, the next, in that item down in that column, in that cluster, it says they're in the drinking water, and that's not in the United, that's not in Seattle. Seattle, we have fantastic water. The only really toxic thing in our water in Seattle, as a quick digression, on any regular basis is chlorine and its breakdown products. And chlorine is quite toxic in the body. I won't elaborate in detail today. That alone is a, um, a reason enough to buy it a water filter. And actually, Brita, even an inexpensive one like Brita, although there's some questions about plastic, uh, but in any case, we'll remove chloroform. I'll tell you a better water filter in a second, though, if you have a little bit more money. Uh, but chlorine, one of the, for example, one of the toxic things that chlorine becomes in public water supply is chloroform. And some of you have heard of chloroform. Mm-hmm. It's a potent neurotoxin, neurosedative. Um, um, Anyway, it's, it, it forms through a natural, natural process of combining with other organic materials in the water. But, but in general, except for the chlorine compounds, our water in Seattle is fantastic, and you don't have to worry about these volatile organics in our water. If you live in um, um, Oklahoma, in the vicinity of the oil wells, absolutely different story. I, I have a patient who uh, moved to Seattle from, I don't know if it was Oklahoma or Texas or where I forget, and grew up. She's, I think, in her 40s now, if I remember correctly. And so this was some time ago. She grew up, she grew up in, in sight of the oil wells all around. It was, it's an, it's a, it's a, the industry in the community, in many of those communities, of course, is, is oil. And, and, and the, more, the more oil there is, the more likely it is that there will be an oil spill, oil gasoline spill, and it will get in the water supply. And, and, and she consumed uh, consider significant amounts, and, and it's measurable in her tissue and her blood and, and urine now. And, and we can fix that, but but uh, Seattle not an issue. Um, sty- the next the next cluster down in this where they are in the home column is mentioned styrofoam, and this is worth pausing on for just a second. If you haven't stopped using styrofoam containers, particularly for hot hot drinks and beverages, and for cold it probably doesn't matter so terribly much, but for hot absolutely. Remember these are these are volatile styrene is a volatile organic chemical. It's cleverly, it's polymerized, it's put into long chains of styrene molecules, which makes it more stable at room temperature. But the second you begin to heat it up, it wants to evaporate. It wants to evaporate anyway, and it will slowly. But if you heat it up with a hot beverage or hot food in your to-go container, 
from the restaurant, etc., it will start to evaporate rapidly. First it melts and then it evaporates. And, and um, uh, it will get in the food, etc., etc. So uh, an easy thing to do is avoid the styrofoam containers. We all know what they are with hot food in particular. It, kind of an interesting point is that tires are made out of styrene. And uh, did, if, if you've ever wondered, as I kind of had but didn't realize I had one of those subliminal wonderings, I guess, where tires go. You know, they don't all go to, the, you, every now and then you see a giant chunk of tire on the side of the road that peeled off of a truck tire. But that's, in general, not where tires go. They, I didn't really, they particulate. They turn to, to powder, which is kind of a big duh, of course. Where, where else would they go? So, and that powder gets in the soil. Some of it we breathe. It gets in the soil. We, kids, kids are playing in the yard. Kids are more exposed than adults to styrene because they're playing in the soil. And again, hand to mouth and all that. And then we track it into our home. So that's why styrene is one of the compounds that was on the list on the first page, the summary list of what's in house dust. You got to run? You got the list. Okay. And it'll be taped if you want to listen to the rest of it. Okay. Thank you. The um, styrene's in um, the house dust too because we're tracking it in from the dust in the yard on our shoe, from the truck tires and car tires. So yet another reason to just take shoes off at the door. Um, Many of these are solvents. These solvents are used in floor finishings, glues, paint, varnishes, the sweetest finish on the floor of the house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're in the dry cleaning chemicals. Many, many of the ones in the middle here, in the, in the other solvent category, these ones that are so hard to pronounce, butyl, butyl cellulose over in the leftmost name column is in clean green. That's, it's in the clean green product, for example, which is relatively clean. Clean green, the spray, green cleaner. It's relatively clean. The, the one toxic material in it, unfortunately, is this butyl cellulose. So green, green, clean green is better than a lot of them, but it does contain this toxic chemical that's listed in the ATSDR toxic data web, web, data, or data, web database for Centers for Disease Control. Um, but, but I put these fancy names, the DEA and the TEA and the APE over here on the left, just to give you an example of several of the, of the most common types of myriad chemicals of the solvent nature that appear in cleaning products in household, in household cleaning products. They're not the world's most, tomic, uh, the, uh, most toxic chemicals, but they are worth knowing about. If, you're, if you really want to reduce your synthetic chemical exposure, you, you, can, you can by simply making different choices in, toxic, in, in household cleaning products. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Mothballs, as you can imagine, um, contain many of these compounds, this family of compounds, hair care products, air freshener, cosmetics, and so on. So um, then going on down the list where they are in the home, I'm going to go back over to the left, left column, the name column, the left vertical column. This item here called MTBE, methyl tert butyl ether, is a very common no-knock compound found in gasoline. Some tend to I think it's 10, 15 percent of gasoline by mass is MTBE. It, it, it too is a fossil fuel derivative, de, uh, de, derivative uh, uh, very toxic to nervous system, immune system. Formaldehyde is a toxin over in the left column. Then moving to the third column over that's present, where is it in the home? It's present in glues. It's present in the glue that uh, holds the, the um, carpet pad down underneath my wall to wall. The carpet strips to the floor. It's in caulkings, caulks, and sealers, as are many of these other solvents. It's in the formaldehyde, and many of these other solvents are in the binding material that's in the composite wood that's becoming more and more popular as hardwood gets harder to come by and more expensive, that now much of the woodwork in our homes and most of the much of the furniture is made out of. Uh, it's in plywood and so on. And so it's particularly in new construction or new furniture that the volatilization, meaning evaporation of formaldehyde and some of these other solvents, is more likely to occur and get into the air in the home. And from the air, either get into our body or condense to the floor and get in the dust. So it's actually relevant. It's part of the, one of the ways to actually steps to reduce exposure to all these solvents. Even the ones in cleaning products and, and in, the, in the, um, the glues, solvents in formaldehyde and glues in the walls and furniture and so on, is actually right back to vacuuming more often, managing the dust in the house, because it'll wind up condensing and accumulating in the dust. Um, so how to avoid the far, furthest right vertical column. So I've, 
I've covered a lot, some of this already. You get the idea. Same old, take shoes off, vacuum more often. I mentioned I, that I'd give you a recommendation for a water filter. There are good, good websites that, that compare water filter um, if, if efficacy, effectiveness, and, and, and show you which ones they've, which toxins, which toxic metal, or which solvent they've been tested for their ability to remove from the water. And um, one of the highest performers for the, the best bang for the buck that I've come across is the aquasana.com. The filters at aquasana.com if you want a simple recommendation. Um, moving down the how to avoid column, you, the low VOC, the low volatile organic compound paints are becoming widely available and much more affordable now. They only cost a little bit more, they only cost a little bit more than, than regular paints. Um, and um, I think are, are well worth the money if you can afford them. And it, again, it's not, it's really, they really don't cost that much more now. Um, you, heard, you heard what I had to say about styrofoam. I promised some um, uh, recommendations for uh, household cleaning products that do not contain any of these synthetic chemicals. And I've listed five companies here that sell such products. Some of them you've seen in the store and heard of and you may already be using. But it really is true. Um, the, the consumer agencies really do monitor this sort of thing. And a good website to check it out and get some of the details is posted right there, the www.organicconsumers.org. And um, learn more about that. Of course, I'm not a fan of dry cleaning or if I occasionally need to dry clean a, between a blanket or a, a jacket, what I do is I'll hang it in the garage for a few days till it off gases before I bring it in the house. Does that make sense? And in general, I have my shirts and stuff down at the, at the, at the cleaner and I just have them do it with soap and water and press them. What about the new alternatives to perk? There are a couple yeah, of there are, many of the dry cleaners have switched over to less toxic dry cleaning materials and that's a really good step and they're still solvents. They're not as bad as the, the perk was but I still suggest that you Minimize your exposure if you can, personally. I would. You can wash blankets in cold water. You can wash blankets in cold water, says Ann. If you have a question about how to wash blanket, talk to Ann. <laughs> Either that or call my mom. She's, she, she, right. My mom definitely knows that, too. Uh -huh. I don't know if it's, if it's a VLC. I, I think it probably is uh, some level. But the, um, the Sunlight Protection Plus uh, Sealers. Where have I heard sealers Okay. Do, well, it's one of the main that's being used for um, homes. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you know... I don't. I'll have to look it up. I'll have to look it up. What does VLC stand for with the paints? Vo volatile organic compound? Yep. Okay, good. I'm going to switch, r jump over to page four. Have I got a few more minutes? Are you guys doing okay? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, we're also, page four, flame retardants is definitely worth a mention. Huge uh, problem getting worldwide wide public health attention, public health attention, uh, publications in, from countries all over the world. Um, uh, I, obviously, it, there's a necessary concern about making products less flammable in our homes. I'm, I'm not convinced as a clinician that going to admixing synthetic chemicals that are, are turning out to be very toxic is the answer. Um, but in any case, PBDE, which is a bromine containing um, etherous compound, which, which also wants to volatilize it, it'll vaporize. It's another volatile organic, actually. I just didn't have room to put it on the other table, so I, I decided to put it off by itself. Um, uh, is, is very, very, very toxic. And unfortunately, um, it's, a, it's a developmental, a neurodevelopmental toxin, meaning it too inhibits some of the developmental properties, properties or processes of the growing nervous system. Again, in utero and in our children. And quite a few papers have been published from health departments around the world looking at the amount of PBDE or its sister chemicals in, in, um, in newborn children or in the blood of mothers or in um, cord blood at childbirth and so on. And, and there's really a public health alarm being raised by how absolutely contaminated worldwide are, are, are in particular our children are. And, the, and obviously because it's a neurodevelopmental disruptor, the children are the group that we're most concerned about. Um, nobody's got a great answer. There's a lot of fear around changing the public policy 
about requiring the flame retardants. So, so let's, as a starting point today, just n helpful to know where they are. Interestingly, they're in electronic equipment. They're in, they're in the TV remote and in the cell phone and in the computer monitor and keyboard and in the computer itself and in fax machines and telephones and so on. They're also in children's toys. We've, we, see, we tend to have surrounded our children with the flame retardants because I think the initial was concern was to protect children from fire, which is, that's legit. No, no, no disagreement there. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the chemical that does suppress combustion that we was, has been used so heavily, the chemical group, has turned out to be con uh, significantly toxic to the children. So it's, they're, most, they're most exposed and most affected. So it's a, a sad uh, situation that, uh, a pub, again, public health agencies are going to move to do something about it. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. But so they're in children's toys. They're in clothed, children's clothing. They're in bedding, mattresses, especially if it's a, a child-sized mattress, et cetera, et cetera. You can, some of the things you can do, this is, and I put down a, a, this website here, the environmentalworkinggroup.org has a super web page on PBDE avoidance, starting with washing hands before eating, because they're all over the home. They're in all of us. You know, there's no getting away from it. But minimize exposure to washing hands in home. When you, when you buy fabrics uh, or materials, mattresses, etc., if you do buy natural, if you'll buy cotton, um, less flammable, i.e. cotton, wool, etc., the, the, the legal requirements on, on PBDE, fire suppressant uh, concentration, are for less because they're not so flammable in the first place. The more flammable synthetic fibers and so on that couches and mattresses and clothing are made of are required to have much higher concentrations of flame suppressant. You with me? So you'll reduce the children's exposure a great deal simply by clothing them in natural fiber, buying them a natural fiber mattress, etc. cetera. Um, and then again, as you can imagine, because of where it is, it's, a, it's chock a block and house dust. So, so vacuum, 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 protect the children. I'm going to then, there are some neat websites in the middle of that page for finding healthier alternatives. And actually, I told you about both of those already. I just reproduced them there so they don't get lost. Uh huh. I just wanted to say that Green Paint has put out a green, um, greener electronics um, portion of their website, and they have which companies are doing PVC and flame electronics free electronics. Wonderful. So Greenpeace's website has some web information, good, good effective web information about, about uh, electronic product free and PV, uh, PBDE free electronics and PVC free electronics and so on. Super. At the, the lower part of this page four is a table on chronic toxicity, excuse me, on pesticides. And I'm gonna skip that one. They're, they're neurotoxic. They're all, almost all neurotoxic and immunotoxic. Um, the simple takeaway uh, for pesticides is, and inse all the, the insecticides, herbicides, and so on, is do what you can to eat organic. And, and I think most of you have heard that before and probably are already working on it. If you can't afford, like most of us, can't afford to eat 100% organic, then go to environmental, I put the website on the, I put it on the last page. Go to the Environmental Working Group's website mm -hmm. and, and get the list of the, the 12 most, the dirty dozen, the 12 most sprayed foods on our table. And know that if you'll simply purchase the organic versions of those when you eat those, that you're avoiding most foodborne pesticides. It's, it's very reassuring and very effective. Um, and then again, when it comes to insecticides, um, vacuum and take your shoes off because they're in the yard uh, and around the home because of past spraying and so on. And they get tracked into the home as well. Uh -huh. And then stop using them. Stop using them. Oh, I did want to tell you that there was a paper published two or three years ago um, these are such, insecticides as a class are such strong neurotoxins. That's how they work. They, they kill insects by poisoning their nervous system. And it turns out they're really hard on our nervous system as well. There was a paper that published uh, uh, a, a clear correlation in uh, home gardening hobbyists. Home gardening hobbyists, so people who garden at home, and higher incidence of neurodegenerative disorder, in particular Parkinson's disease. These are adults. Does that make sense? So the cat's out of the bag on this, although it's not being widely discussed. So if, if you're a, a hobbyist gardener, do stay away from insecticides. Uh -huh. Wow, neat. 
Wow, neat. So food grade pest uh, repellents at what website? Pest dash talk dot com. Great. Wonderful. Oh, he's right here in Seattle. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Good. Good. Question? Question? Oh. Great. He sounds wonderful. Mm-hmm. What about disinfectants and fungicides? Do they fall in that same? Disinfectants and fungicides are definitely in the pesticide category, absolutely. And most of them are immunotoxic and neurotoxic, too. What about um, chlorine bleach? Chlorine, chlorine bleach, bleach is um, toxic to almost all living tissue. It's a, most of the, in fact, most of these solvents, one of the principal reasons, not most of them, but many of them, one of, the, one of the principal reasons that most solvents, these volatile organics, are toxic is, be, they be, is because they contain chlorine molecules or bromine, a related halogen sister compound. Does that make sense? So the chlorine family of compounds are very toxic. Would um, you still often clean bleach and disinfecting mm-hmm. and right. and right. Chlorine makes a wonderful disinfectant. If it is used, it volatilizes quickly. So ventilation is important. And uh, as long as the cleaning occurs at some time at, at the school or daycare when the children are not present, and as long as they vacuum regularly, uh, they shouldn't, and it's ventilated well, they should not be exposed to chlorine from that. Okay, and a lot of times they're doing it with the kids. Yeah, well, then the, the children are being exposed. But we're all exposed every time we take a bath or a shower, too, if we don't have a shower filter. Yeah. Let me save these. I, before we run out of time, I want, I've got one more page. And we may set a record here, but um, this is page five. Because it, page five is about other chemicals in home. There's four, and every one of them is important and worth knowing about, so I really appreciate your patience. The first one is phthalates, and you've heard of this. These are the plasticizers that, uh, um, when added to, in, in the same box, you'll see, I'm in, the, I'm in the leftmost name, the vertical column called name here on page five. Everybody with me? The first, first item is phthalates, which are the, the, the compounds that when added to PVC, which is the polyvinyl chloride, is the hard part of plastic, make it softer and more malleable and bendable and easy to make containers and cups and dishes and refrigerator containers and stuff out of. So these two are interrelated, PVC and phthalates. They're, they're um, potent toxins to liver, kidney, lungs, routes of excretion. They cause uh, birth defects. They're measurable. They're measurable in all of our bodies. People all over the world. Less is better. Um, fertility problems. Every single one of the compounds on this page is a potent hormone disruptor. In particular, they interfere with the function of the endocrine. Excuse me, the estrogen-related hormone system. So they cause estrogen-related problems in a menstruating woman. They can actually cause uh, menstrual irregularity in ovarian cysts. They increase the rates, risks of um, breast cancer, of estrogen-related cancers, um, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, etc. They they increase um, um, they they cause fertility and infertility problems in men and women. They reduce sperm counts and so on. Big, so it's a big deal, and all four of them worldwide, we're all being massively exposed. So it's worth knowing about so that you can reduce your exposure through some, some simple choices and then join, if you're interested, join the proactive movement to do something about it. The, um, uh, the BPA, the second group down, bisphenol A, you've heard about that, um, is a polycarbonate compound. It's wonderful make, for making hard, clear plastic water bottles. The... Um, same, very similar toxic profile. Um, many hard clear plastics uh, contain, are made from BPA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm going I'm to actually make my way down the chronic toxicity column just to see if there's anything else I want to mention. Oh, I hadn't talked about dioxins. Dioxins are the third group, the third toxin down. Very toxic chemicals, some of the most toxic chemicals known to science, known to humans. 
They're, they're made every time that a chlorine-containing compound is burned. So burning of garbage has put tons and tons of dioxin in it because the garbage contains all kinds of stuff, plastic packaging and bottles, and you get the idea. Um, small amounts are burned just in our cars or uh, in our fire, or produced in our fire, fireplace or from combu internal combustion engines. If you burn material in the yard, know that you're producing small amounts of dioxin. So they're in the soil. So they come into that. That's why they're on that list of what's in soil on the first page. They get into the soil. In fact, there was an article in NPR two weeks ago. I heard it in my car on the way to work. A paper had been published about dioxins in house dust. I kid you not. It's like the issue of house dust and toxicity is now on the radar. Um, and obviously, the recommendation was they actually said it on the radio take your shoes off of the door. Ta da, we've arrived. So. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, perfluorinated hydrocarbons, the, the PFCs, the, the last group down, that's the, that's the waterproofing, the Scotch Guard, the Teflon that lines the nonstick pans, which I encourage you to stop using. When these, these want, that want to volatilize, they will melt, they'll slowly disintegrate at high heat. It takes a long, long time, but they do get into the food and therefore into our bodies at measurable quantities. Health departments all over the world are studying PFCs, and they're in all of us. And, and, the, and they haven't been around all that long, 20 years or something. Turns out they're one of the most long-lived compounds. They, all, they, they takes forever to de degrade, which makes sense. That's what they were intended to do, degrade slowly, and to bear up under high heat and pressure and so on. And, and unfortunately, we did too good a job. They last virtually forever. And the more they're studied, the more poisonous they turn out to be, as you can read. The, um, then back up to the top, I'm going to start down in the third vertical column where they are in the home and fill in the blanks. The phthalates, of course, are in plastics. They're in vinyl flooring, any vinyl products, the tiles on the kitchen floor or the bathroom floor. They're, the, they're, um, the, um, they're in some food wraps. They're actually in adhesives and caulking and nail polish. They're in foods and beverages because so many foods and beverages are purchased or stored in the fridge or, or, or consumed in, in uh, plastic containers. So they're in the foods and beverages. The, um, then they're in house dust, because all these plastics around us are slowly dis disintegrating, and that particulate matter winds up in the dust on the floor like everything else. The bisphenol A is in some hard, clear plastics. It's in the lining, unfortunately, of most cans. And you may have read about, you may have heard about this. Anybody hear about the lining of can problem with BPA? Yes. It's, it's now on the radar. Um, I've, I've put for you, this is a nifty website that publishes this data, over on the right, the seven companies that do not use BPA to line cans. And for now, you can count on that, because it is being monitored by consumer agencies. Cons uh -huh. Excuse me. It's also really high on receipts. High what? It, BPA is found receipts. high levels on receipts. On receipts. Yeah. Wow. The paper. So wash your hands when you come up from the store. Yet another reason. And holy cow, next time you ought to help me give this lecture because you really know a lot. That's really great. Um, they're in the lining of most cans. Um, they're um, very toxic. You can see the list of problems for, from fertility to, in addition to all that estrogen disruption, some cancer, cardiovascular problems, diabetes type 2, and so on. Actually, no. Cancer is not on the list. Yes, it is. Cancer. Um, dioxin, um, very, very toxic, blah, blah, blah. Where is it in the home? It's mostly in the dust. It's mostly in the dust. And the perfluorinated, perfluorinated fluorine is an, is an atom. Perfluor these are interesting. These molecules through an micro atomic microscope would look like a centipede. They're these long chains of carbon with all these fluoride molecules coming off the side. Fluorine, like that. It, and they're, they're tied together in these long strands, and they last forever. And are more, the more they're studied, the more disruptive and a, of a problem that, that we're finding out they are. They're, used, they're waterproofers, so they're used to they're waterproof the inside of a, um, you buy, a, you buy a, a, a nice organic container of soup at the store in one of those cardboard packages, and it, it's got that plasticky stuff inside. Well, that's PFC. You with me? Some of it's in the food. Yeah, they're in nonstick pans. We covered that. They're, they're, they line most plastic racks. They're, they're, they're in a very thin layer on the surface of most plastic wraps to make them more waterproof and less sticky, or maybe more sticky. I'm not sure. 
And most of all, and this is kind of scary, well, they're in house dust, of course, but the scariest source of all that I've ever read about is in microwave popcorn. Mm -hmm. The amount of PFC that's in microwave popcorn, because the, there's this thick layer of PFC that lines the microwave popcorn container, and then the high, high, intense energy that it's exposed to, it volatilizes and it gets in. The, po the PFC content of microwave popcorn is, is truly alarming. So if you took away like three or four takeaways from today, one of them would be stop, um, well, maybe six or seven, but it would be stop eating microwave popcorn specifically. And stop your children, like Nobody's grab done. it away from your children. Like, no, go home and go to your neighbor's houses and take their microwave popcorn out of the cupboard and throw it in the garbage. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe you shouldn't do that, but at least talk to them about it. Um, the, the corn is safe since it started producing the fuel corn and they're, they're pollinating each other? The corn? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you come at, tell me more about that at the break? Okay. Or when we're done? That'd be great. Um, so I've talked about how to avoid, I've, I've hit on some of it, obviously. Start storing your containers, to store, storing your food at home in the fridge in glass, and uh, glass containers, glass, microwave it in glass. Um, avoid bottled water in general, if, if in, and switch to a stainless steel water bottle or a glass water bottle. They're widely available and the prices have come down some. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually don't know about that. Is that right? So SIG bottles may have a lining, and you uh, check that out on the web. They used to. They used to. Um, so the old ones did. Um, See? You, why don't you just come up here? <laughs> <laughs> they don't anymore. But they, they were really secretive about it when the whole BPA thing came out. And, but then they finally said that they did have it. Now they're producing more of that. Mm -hmm. So now they're producing without? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, so public action worked again. Good. Thank you very much. So SIG water bottles are now, recently, BPA lining free. And if a person has an older SIG water bottle, they might want to think about switching it out for a new one. Um, let's see. Over here in the how to avoid column, the little third cluster. The third cluster down, it says avoid vinyl flooring um, and, and plastic and vinyl shower curtains. Um, that stuff you smell when you open up a new shower curtain, that's PVC and phthalate. It's, it's, there's so much of it and it's so volatile, it, it, you can smell it off-gassing for weeks or months. Mm -hmm. And it stays in your body a long time. The um, small amounts of it too. Uh, choose stainless steel or glass containers for cooking and storage of food and so on. And, and some, relative, some less, less toxic plastic containers, so if you do use them, are the number one, the number five, and the number four. Mm -hmm. That's the little triangle on the bottom. They're not perfect, but they're a whole lot better. I wouldn't heat them. I still wouldn't heat them. It'll increase their volatilization. Yeah. But for cold storage in fridge or water bottles, if you're going to use one of those, use one. There's some evidence that, that old plastic water bottles emit more of these toxic substances because as the bottle, water bottle ages, it degrades. So if, you do, if you're in the habit of using a plastic water bottle over and over, to put your filtered water in and take it to work and so on. Maybe just use it a few times and then get a new one. Would perhaps be that advice. Take shoes off at the door. It's tracked into the homeowner's shoes. Is the, that's where the dioxins come from. Vacuum and I think I've covered it. Yay. So, and then page six is a summary of all the how to, what to do. And I can, like I said, I can stay and answer questions as long as you like and mold. And feel free to leave. I, we will not be. I really appreciate your patience. Uh, I didn't talk about mold. Did I promise to talk about mold? No, you didn't promise. Mold's a big, complicated topic, and uh, uh, <laughs> where to begin? Yeah, where to begin? <laughs> but I'm sure. I'm sure some of you know quite a bit about mold. Um, it's a real issue. Uh, I think that uh, the time is. It's, it's, it's time has come in the sense that it really is taking, being taken seriously by public health agencies. I think of a person, mold is, is very toxic to the immune system, in particular very disruptive and confusing to the nervous system. Uh, it can cause many, many different problems in many different organ systems, chronic fatigue and headache and, and, and all kinds of problems, sleep disorders. And, um, uh, probably because most of all it's so overstimulating and, and dysregulating to the immune system. The, um, 
if, if there's visible mold growing in your home, it's completely worth getting rid of it, doing something about it. If there's, if there's mold, even small amounts of the, the, in general, the black molds are the problem, although not all black molds are among those that are tox so toxic. Some are, and since I can't tell, it's not something one can tell by looking at it. If there's, if there's any mold, clean it up, get rid of it. And there are super websites that, that talk about how to do that. Um, if, uh, if you're concerned, so if there's, if there's mold in the tile grout, it, there are ways to remove that. Talk to a tile store, talk to them at Home Depot. If there's mold in the shower or the kitchen in the uh, caulking, in the areas that are so prone to being damp all the time and accumulating mold, cut that out yourself or have somebody who knows how to do it, cut it out and replace it. It's not that hard, it's a little tedious, but it's not that difficult. It's worth getting rid of the mold that you can see in your home. If, um, especially if anybody has uh, respiratory problems, asthma, allergies, because the antigens that they put out are first of all airborne and come into our body through our respiratory tract. Does that make sense? So especially for asthmatics or people with, especially for asthmatics, and second, people with chronic allergies. They're highly allergenic. Um, if you have a concern about um, mold that you can't see in your home, call up. I didn't bring it with me, but, but uh, get online and Google on the American Lung Association, Seattle, Seattle. Because the Seattle chapter of the American Lung Association, does anybody happen to know my expert? That, yeah. You're, you're both master home environmentalists. So uh, would one of you master home environmentalists tell us about the program? Or do you feel like it or would you? Yeah. You'll probably yeah. get it right or the... Absolutely. With the American Lung Association, it's a volunteer program where you go through the eight weeks of training. It's fantastic. Yeah, you go through and you have guest speakers and they really cover like a lot of the dust, the molds, all the biological things, the VOCs that can come into a home. And as a volunteer, what you do is go to people's homes that feel like they have some kind of a health concern and help them identify them and give them low-cost alternatives to healing their home and identifying great programs. It's absolutely fantastic. So you could probably also Google on Master Home Environmentalist Seattle. Do yeah. you want to say the phone number? I do you don't know? Don't that, that's okay. But, ma but ma Master American Home Lung Association, Master Home Environmentalist Program. Yep, American Lung Association, Seattle, Master Home Environmentalist Program. And it's free service, and the, 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 the personnel will come to the home in addition with lots of knowledge and expertise with a, a moisture meter, right? They, no? The volunteers don't always have it, but the, the staff in the, they have the C-Core group, that a lot of times they'll take a moisture meter. Okay, so, so somebody has so turn in Seattle. So, the, so there, there may be availability of a, even bringing a moisture meter for looking for, which, if you can identify, if the, the technician can identify moisture at an increased level in the wall, that increases the likelihood, although it doesn't confirm it, but it increases the possibility that there might be mold growing out of sight behind the wall, because, because moisture plus stagnant airflow equals mold growth, fungal growth. Uh -huh. Another thing you can do is get a hygrometer, which measures the relative humidity in a home, and if you have high humidity at home, most likely you're going to have mold, so that's good. a good way to monitor where your home health is. Wonderful. So measure just general humidity in home. And actually, uh, if there's further concern or if someone in the home is allergic and you're not sure if there's a mold problem or not, problem or not one of the first steps you can take is to buy an air dehumidifier. They work pretty well. They work quite well. And um, just start using it and either empirically see if that makes a difference or that could just be a first step in the asthmatic person's home while you're waiting for your appointment with your master home environmentalist. Or just yeah. ventilation. ventilation. Yeah, improve ventilation. Yeah, if you, like the old homes in Seattle that don't have good um, yeah. ventilation. Yeah. Really monitoring showers, how long showers are, anything that you're using, a lot of water, make sure you're venting. It's moist, it's moisture plus lack of ventilation. You, you just reminded me, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm like a double, triple Virgo, whatever. I, um, I actually squeegee yeah. my shower walls yeah. and then I wipe them down with a clean cloth that I yeah. bought at Costco. And every time I shower, and I try to make everybody else do that too. Because, in, in, and it grows virtually no no mold in there ever, well, which is a good thing. You're removing a lot of the mold foods. You're removing the soaps and the hairs and stuff like that. Which oh. Mold foods, so you're doing two things. You're less moisture and less mold food. So cleaning the wall after the shower also removes the foods that the mold's going to grow on. You have to use toxic products to maintain your shower. Yeah. So you don't have to restore anything. 
it's, it's prevention, so we don't have to get into toxic mold killing products later. Plus, it reduces the moisture level in my whole home, because oh, yeah. that water would have evaporated and spread around the home, increasing likelihood that no, mold would. I didn't know that. I should do this master home and my mouse. So mold, in, so so moisture incur, incur, encourages house du, dust mite exposure. Yes. Let, let me, but that's absolutely super. Let me just change the subject though, and see if there's any other type of question because if somebody's might be sitting on one, uh huh. You wanted to talk about ammonia. Oh. Well, I have to admit I don't actually know that much. Well, ammonia is a natural substance, yeah. and I didn't put on here because it's not technically a synthetic chemical. But it is in concentration injurious to tissue, uh, mo most notably lungs and eyes, so, so mucous membranes that it contacts in concentration. So the key with ammonia, there's two things about ammonia. One is avoid concentrated exposure by using it in ventilated, only in a good vent with good ventilation. In the, does that make sense? And the other is never ever <coughs> use it when there's chlorine around. Uh, chlorine, chlorine in any, so bleach, chlorine powder cleansers, etc. Because the ammonia, it's very well understood, is the quickest way to turn the solid chlorine material in the powder or the, the bleach into chlorine gas, Cl2, chlorine gas. It'll turn it into a chlorine vapor immediately, and whoever's using the two products uh, and mixing them with each other in the shower stall or whatever will breathe chlorine gas. And every year there are health department unfortunate reports about people being very seriously injured very seriously injured by doing that. So anyway, with those two simple precautions, ammonia is a safe and by and technically natural cleanser. Can we add it to the list? You can do what abs whatever you like. I thought I actually typed it in and then I took it off okay. because it can hurt people and it, and it maybe maybe if you diluted it it would be safer. Well its toxicity is all about the quantity you're exposed to at once. So sure, if you dilute it, it will be safer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you think about, like, because of the topic of oceans now, about seaweeds. Yeah, that's a great question. And, I, and it's on my hot list to learn more about because it's been coming up a bunch lately. Um, I know that there is mercury in it's seaweed, and I'm, I have a hunch it probably varies a bit from some from seaweed to seaweed and bay to bay, and so on, harvest place, harvest place. So, um, but the 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 good news is, and it's in there because it's in all it's in everything that's in the ocean because there's mercury in solution in the ocean. But also it's in there because the alginate compounds, which are sea vegetables' version of fiber, uh, very tightly bind mercury atoms. They they, they bind onto it. And the good news is this is a very, very strong bond. Very strong. Which, and so I'm hoping, and I don't know if anybody's ever studied, studied this, but these compounds have been studied for their ability to, to remove mercury from water supplies, you know, to clean up, excuse me, mercury contaminated water supplies. So we know that they'll bind mercury. Whether or not they'll release it after I, after I eat it and let it go into my body is the question that you're after, and it's a super question. I'm hoping the answer is no, because, and it's very possible that the answer is no, because they bind it very, very tightly.